Recently, someone posted on the debate subreddit a very long, almost two hour video on how to do the summary speech and final focus. And some of the things they said inspired me to want to give my own video on some debate subjects. And this is that video. And specifically, I want to respond to or extend upon this concept that we had a conversation in the comments about, which was the notion of maximizing efficiency and minimizing exposure and how I think that functions in debate, and more importantly, why that is a concept that matters in debate. So this uh, video essay is called The Human Condition and Debate, the Win by One Model. There's a few things I wanna talk about. The first is gonna be what I view to be the fundamental principle of debate. Second, I wanna talk about making the subjective objective with regards to decision-making and debate. Next, we will discuss the win by one model, the thesis of this video largely, and lastly, we'll talk about a real world example in AlphaGo, which is a AI developed by Google to play a board game. But first, the fundamental principle of debate. It is my belief that the principle of debate, fundamental to debate, how to win debates effectively, how to win every ballot guaranteed can be summarized by the first sentence in the overview that you can see on this page, which is the fundamental win condition in any debate is to convince the judge to vote for you. It's that simple, it really is. And people try and blow it up and people don't like to hear that. It's not very enticing. People want cheat codes and hacks to be able to like read certain arguments that uh, make it easier to win or whatever, but you have to understand this before you get to anything else, that in order to win a debate, a judge has to circle our name on a piece of paper that then goes into a computer and that will determine seating for the rest of the tournament. And sometimes this doesn't mean convincing the judge to vote for us. Sometimes this means convincing the judge not to vote for the other team. Sometimes it just means making the judge like you more. There's a million and a half ways to do this, but you have to understand this first and foremost before we can move on. You do not win debates if the judge doesn't vote for you, if the judge doesn't circle it. And this is important for a few reasons, but most importantly, because it means the judge is probably never wrong. If you can accept that, that the judge is never wrong, because if they didn't vote for you, it simply means you didn't convince them to vote for you, or you confused them, you made it hard for them to vote for you, then you'll get a lot better debate. Because... If you can approach the debate in that way, you'll understand that you have to modify yourself and your argumentation and your style in such a way that will give you those ballots consistently. That will be a high expected value play, a high efficiency play, good percentages, which is very important in the grand scheme of things. But how do we do that, right? What What is the kind of cheat code I can give you that hopefully will elucidate something about debate and your understanding of it? I think that's our B point, which is making the subjective objective. So what do I mean by that? Subjectivity. When we talk about subjectivity and subjective decisions, what we really are talking about is that individuals have their own preferences, biases, etc. things that they use as uh, evaluatory mechanisms, right? A sort of rubric to make decisions. And it's that simple, right? If I uh, am going out to get ice cream with my friends, right, I have a rubric, whether I know it or not, that makes me choose the ice cream I want, right? Sometimes that's, I just like chocolate chip ice cream, whatever, right? Cookie dough's great. Rocky Road's, you know, the one, whatever. Sometimes that's, well, I want something more savory. I'm going to get something a little like a salted caramel kind of ice cream. I really want something fruity. It's going to be the sherbet for me, whatever, right? Those are subjective decisions. There's not a implicit justification that we can count on consistently in the decision-making process that occurs there. And this is also true in debate and a lot of judged activities, but I want to point to a specific field that I think can elucidate some things about debate, and that is the world of competitive gymnastics. In gymnastics, the gymnasts do routines, right? And those routines are then graded often on a scale going to like 10.0, so 9.9, 9.8, etc., whatever. And despite the fact that in theory, because this is a judged event, there is a subjective criteria for the routines, you very rarely see a high variance in the scores of judges in gymnastics, right? No one's going to give someone a 9.9 .9 and have another judge give them a 3. It's unheard of. Like, that person would be, like, taken aside and kicked out of the event, 
which unfortunately we can't do in debate. But the bottom line is, despite the fact it's subjective, somehow there is an objective underlying thread that results in these consistent scorings, right? And that's our goal in debate. I, I call this the the alchemy of debate, right? And that's impact calculus. The comparison of impacts, the method by which we largely convince the judge to vote for us. And when I talk to my students about impact calculus, I always use a quote from Bruce Lee. And what Bruce Lee said was, a punch is a punch, and then a punch is not a punch, and then a punch is a punch again. And I think this is very true of debate and especially true of impact calculus because everyone seems to know that impact calculus is really important, but there's very little focus on actually developing the skill or understanding why it's important or how to do it effectively. And so let's just go through the quote as an analogy for debate, right? So a punch is a punch. What does that mean? Well, initially, when you're learning martial arts, whatever that martial art may be, a punch is just a punch, right? You know how to punch. It is a punch to the head. It's straight. It's a cross. It's a jab. It's whatever. It is just some mechanical thing you can do to exert force upon your opponent that you can train, right? And it, it's not much beyond that, right? A novice understands that impacts exist and that they matter, but they don't really understand how to leverage them despite the fact they read them in every debate, right? Then, all of a sudden, when you've done it, you know, 10,000, 20,000, whatever, X amount of times, a punch is more than a punch, right? You have this sort of intuitive feel. You've pulled back the Wizard of Oz's curtain. You understand something about the punch that you think makes it special, right? Other people don't see this. There's something about this punch they haven't figured out, right? That, oh, it's not just that a jab is a punch. A jab is a measuring tool. It allows me to know whether my opponent can hit me and whether I can hit them. It is both offensive and defensive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's true of debate. You get into open debate, varsity debate, whatever you want to call it at your level, and you feel like you know impact calculus because you know the words magnitude, probability, and the time frame, right? Or whatever severity, reversibility. You just think you know how to do it better than other people because you have some understanding of it. And you start to win more debates, hopefully, right? But the problem is other people also know that. And I think it's important to note that a lot of people get stuck at this level, right? That's all impact calculus is to them. They feel they've demystified it and because they know these words, right? And they're winning some debates. And that's not the end of it, right? Which brings us to the last part, which is, and then a punch is a punch again. Because when you get really good at anything, when you've reached a level of mastery, mastery almost exclusively comes down to a mastery of the fundamentals. Understanding the most basic precepts of whatever art it is or activity it is you are trying to play, right? In chess, that might be the end game and openings. In karate, that might be just kicks and punches, whatever, right? I don't have necessarily specific examples for those, but... Mastering the basics to a degree that you have now completely demystified them, right? In that second step, you mystified it. You thought a punch was more than it actually is. You thought an impact was more than it actually is. But at the end of the day, impacts are very simple. They are very intuitive. The reason an impact exists is because of lay debate, right? A lot of people think of it as a flow concept, but really it just comes from conversation, right? This is how we actually debate things in the real world. And as a result, this brings me to my next point, which is making the decision objective, right, as opposed to subjective, the first step is always convincing the judge that a given impact is the most important impact in the round, okay? Pay attention to that. It really matters. There's going to be a bunch of impacts in these rounds, right, depending on what the topic is. Dehumanization, genocide, extinction, whatever, right? A bunch of these impacts. And your job is to convince the judge that a given impact is most important. Because if an impact is not identified as most important, right? If you and the other team just go for competing claims and you don't have any reasons to prefer or whatever, that's when subjectivity gets introduced back into the activity. That's when the judge is like, well, I don't know. I think lives really matter, but I think that like dehumanization is a thing, or I think that slavery is bad, but like those people probably want to be alive, whatever. It's, it's impossible. Well, it's not impossible. It is very possible. They will make the decision, right? But it will be interventionist in some regards. They will impose their subjectivity on it because you have failed to perform alchemy. You haven't turned the lead into gold. You haven't identified the most important impact, right? The second part, though, is once you've identified the most important impact, you have to actually win it, Okay. And that's what I want to talk about, this concept of do not pass go, okay? Like, monopoly, all right? 
You pass go, you get two hundred dollars. You do not pass go, right? These are cards you get sent to jail. You just don't get the two hundred. You get screwed over. You lose the debate. You take your twenty sevens and you go to lunch. When I say do not pass go, what I mean is a lot of students because they haven't judged don't understand how you actually make a decision as a judge, right? Or how that functions. What you need to understand is once a judge has essentially decided on the impact that is the most important and decided who has won that impact, the debate is largely over. And I think this ties back into the lecture, I believe it was by John Mayero. That was the YouTube channel. I apologize if it's someone else who actually produced the content. It was very good. Um, they talk about this notion of, you know, having lines of offense and being consistent with those lines of offense and being collapsible, right? We have to pick a strategy in the end. We can't do new things. All that is very true. And the most important part is like this notion of do not pass go. If I'm a judge, let's just say I'm judging around, right? You know, there's advantage one, advantage two, or and disadvantage one, disadvantage two. You can call them contentions. You can call them counter contentions. You can call them whatever you want. But bottom line, there's two affirmative arguments and there's two negative arguments, okay? And I go to the affirmatives argument, right? Contention one, whatever, advantage one. And they have an extinction impact, and I think they have access to that extinction impact. And this debate, it has been decided by the debaters that extinction is the most important thing in the round. Once I have reached that point where I have decided extinction is the most important, the affirmative has one extinction, I think myself, and more importantly, almost every judge I know, stops evaluating the debate. Like, that's it. I don't go to the second affirmative advantage and go, well, they also won that they'll save seven cats from trees. That doesn't matter. All you have to do is win the most important impact. The impact that the debaters have decided is my sort of decision rule. Okay? Which demystifies impact calculus in a lot of ways. Because once you understand that, it's very easy to see that collapsing is important, right? Having that consistent line of strategy is, and offense, is incredibly important. Because... If you haven't made a decision by the end of the debate to go for a given position, you are forcing the judge to make that decision for you, and it can only look bad. You have not written their ballot for them. This was another tremendously insightful thing that the creator of that video talked about, right? You don't want to frame your offense in such a way that it's just like, we have seven impacts, they have three impacts, we win. Our one impact is bigger than their impact. You need to write their ballot for them. There should be an overview at the top of these back half speeches, right? Rebuttals if you're in parley, final focus and summary if you're in public forum, whatever, for all the other you know formats of debate. That should literally start with, you are voting for our team, say your names, on contention X, whatever that contention is, for impact Y, which will outweigh the other team's impact of Z, right? This is what we went for. If we win that argument, here's what we won. We think the other team's going to go for this. Our thing is more important than that. That should literally be a sentence. The judge should write that on their ballot. I vote to ask because they won blah, 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 which is more important than blah, 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 blah. That's your job. Which gets us into the next part, right? Impact calculus. How hard is it? How simple is it really? How do we make the subjective objective? Well, let's talk about the most basic level of impact calculus, right? If the affirmative team says that the AF will save seven lives and the negative team says that doing nothing or doing the counter plan will instead save eight lives, who wins that debate? Hopefully that's obvious to you. Objectively speaking, saving eight lives is better than saving seven lives. Almost always. There's, I'm sure, some judge who disagrees, some philosophers who disagree, but that's largely relevant, right? If our goal is to win the largest percentage of debates possible, we want to do the highest expected value play. And in that instance, being the team that won, you save more lives, is better. Okay, if we're talking about a strict magnitude level analysis, don't impose your subjective things on this for now. If the question, however, is instead, the AF saves seven lives and the negative saves eight billion dollars, how is the judge supposed to make that decision unless you've told them what's more important, right? Is money more important? Is lives more important? Direct comparison. How much money is a life worth? Okay? We are trying to turn a subjective decision into an objective decision by allowing for points of comparison. And how do we do that? 
Well, we do that through magnitude, time frame, probability, warranted analysis of comparison of those impacts, things of that nature, right? But ultimately, that's our goal. Uh, what if the AF is we save seven lives and the NEG is we have a 50% chance of saving 14 lives? Are those the same to you? Are they the same to the judge? How do we know? Well, we know because we told the judge, right? Ideally, we did this analysis for them. If we didn't, we didn't do our job, right? Once again, we only have to win the most important impact. It is unlikely that the judge is going to look to another one once we've won the biggest thing in the debate. Which gets back to basics of impact calculus, right? Maybe second level analysis. It's about winning two out of three, right? If we're saying that magnitude, time frame, and probability are how people evaluate debates, largely speaking, yes, there are other ways, then it's not enough to win magnitude because we need to have a tiebreaker effectively, right? If it's, we say we save seven lives, they say they say seven lives, like how do we know whose is better? That's an impossible decision to make in a lot of ways, right? Do we go to presumption? Do we have to like evaluate other things? No, that's where time frame and probability come in, right? Who saved those lives sooner? Who will save those lives in perpetuity? Who is more likely to save those lives? These kind of things. Winning two out of three, okay? I'm going to be doing more content on higher level impact calculus and those kind of things, but this is largely just to get to the point of the video, which is let's talk about the win by one model. What does that mean? The first thing we need to understand is a concept called MED, which is in the medical field, minimum effective dosage. So what does that mean? Well, I think it's pretty accurately titled. It is the minimum amount of a drug that we, or a treatment, that we give to patients that is effective. Okay? If someone has cancer and we're going to give them radiotherapy, how much do we give them, right? Well, we give them this much because this is the amount that generally speaking works. Okay, it's the same thing in debate. Our goal is to do the minimum amount possible to win the debate. And we'll talk about why that's true in just a second here. But just remember, minimum effective dosage refers to the fact that it is the minimum amount we can give and still have success. That should always be our goal, right? And the reason that should be our goal, and we shouldn't go beyond that, is because of the second point here, which is the risk of overdosing, right? If we have antivenom, let's say someone got bit by a rattlesnake, right? And we have rattlesnake antivenom. And we give them the minimum effective dose, there's a very high chance they'll survive, right? If we give them a little more than that, still a very high chance they'll survive, right? There's a likely low risk of side effects. But if we give them like a hundred times the amount that we were supposed to give them, it actually ends up with that person dying more often than not, right? They overdose. Same thing is true of morphine, right? Morphine is useful for treating pain in a lot of instances, but if you give someone too much, they will absolutely die, which is the same with debate. People have lost sight of that fundamental principle we talked about earlier, right? To win every ballot, we have to convince the judge to vote for us. And what they don't understand is there is a minimum threshold at which we can accomplish that goal. We don't have to win every sheet, every argument, every warrant. We just have to win those that are most important and just enough to get over that finish line, right? Once we're across it, nothing else matters. It doesn't matter if you beat your opponent by one second in a race or by an hour in a race. You won the race at the end of the day. And that's our goal. And in debate, that comes back to this concept of maximizing efficiency and minimizing exposure. That was talked about extensively in that video. And I want to kind of warrant this by talking about AlphaGo. For those of you who don't know, AlphaGo was an AI that was developed by Google to play the game Go, right? And Go is a game of Asian heritage that some people compare it to checkers or chess. I don't quite understand the game myself to be completely honest, but bottom line, all you need to know for this example is People thought it was like impossible to program Go. That like you just couldn't program something to play Go to be better. It's not like chess. It's not a solvable game. There's too many issues associated with it for whatever reason. And it turns out those people were horribly wrong, right? Now, initially when AlphaGo played like the 103rd best player in the world, it just got bodied, right? AlphaGo got completely destroyed and it was embarrassing. And people were like, well, we were right about the programming thing. But less than a year later, they had AlphaGo play one of the top 10 players of all time in Go, and they played a series of games, and AlphaGo was dominating. It won several games before the other person got a single one, and it was doing moves that analysts and experts just were really confused about. They're like, no one's ever played this move in professional play as far as we can tell. This doesn't make any sense. Why isn't it doing this common move or this defense right? And the reason for that 
came down to one of the precepts of programming, right? Which is that AlphaGo, the purpose of this program, was your job is to win Go games, okay, right? You are here to win and go. You are not here to be uh, a famous Go player. You are not here to dominate your opponents or to embarrass your opponents or any of those things. You are exclusively here to win games of Go. And what AlphaGo identified was that there was a win condition in Go, i.e. if you are up in material or whatever it's called by one point at the end of the game, you still win the game. And this is very important. Once again, this is that same parallel to racing, right? If you win by one second or win by one hour, you still win the race. And so what AlphaGo had done in its development of its playstyle was focus exclusively on meeting that win condition rather than anything else. And what they found in their analysis post-fact was that humans had an issue where they would try and win by a substantial amount, right? Because calculating it was very difficult to know if you'd win by one. It seemed risky to win by one. But in reality, it was the other way around that was true, right? And this is very true in debate. If you try and win on every sheet of paper, every single argument, you expose yourself to a ton of risk. Because at the end of the debate, if your opponent wins one of those sheets of paper and they win that it's more important than all the other sheets of paper, you are going to lose the debate. Okay, your job is to identify the most important thing and win by the minimum amount possible because that is what minimizes exposure to trade-off. It is much easier to win by one than it is to win by one million. Your judge is much more likely to believe you, whether they're a lay critic or a flow critic, if you can make an objective decision that comes down to winning by one, winning by the minimum effective amount, reducing your exposure to trade-offs and to risk. That's what I wanted to talk about today. I'll probably be doing other videos in the future, and I thank you for listening to this one. Have a great day.